Okay, well, who have we got here and why are we here? Um, well, starting, starting in the middle, we have uh, Rita Mayala, uh, notice my Finnish pronunciation, uh, who's uh, uh, director of the Department for Higher Education and Science Policy in the Finnish government. And, and her role, which is a slightly terrifying role, is that she's responsible for drafting policies for science and innovation and indeed implementing them. Uh, drafting is fine, implementing sounds terribly serious. Um, then we have Claire McLaughlin sitting next to me. Um, Claire uh, is a counsellor for education and science uh, at the Australian Mission for the, to the European Union, where her responsibility, a large part of it, is to um, stimulate interact interaction in, in science, technology, and innovation with the, the European science and innovation base. And last but um, uh, not least, is Mark Thorley, who is head of science information at the UK Natural Environment Research Council and responsible for the NERC networks uh, of environmental data centers. Uh, and as Kevin mentioned, he's been in this game for quite some, quite some while. Um, <clears throat> it would be interesting to, first of all, as there's going to be significant audience participation, I hope, to understand a little bit about the audience. Um, I'm just a simple scientist. I deal with a lot of data. I sort of generate it and try to use it. And then there are these rather odd folk that Tony described in his talk uh, as being um, uh, data engineers, data analysts, and data stewards. And then he accused most of the people here of being data stewards, which you might or might not be pleased about. It would be helpful to begin with, who thinks of themselves here as primarily a scientist who generates and uses data? Let's have some hands in the air. There are about six of us. <laughs> OK, we're, we're heavily outnumbered. Um, and then who are, again using Tony's definition, dead engineers, analysts, and stewards? Come on, don't be shy. OK, that's, that's it, an interesting uh, distinction. Uh, and maybe you think it's important that it should be that way at meetings like this, that we don't want scientists to get too much involved in doing anything other than working away at the lab bench. Or you might think that really they ought to be more involved, but that might come out. Uh, as Kevin has said, the cr crucial issue that we want to talk about now is, of course, the recognition that science is inherently an international enterprise. But the way in which scientists work is, very, is largely determined by national culture, national policies and priorities. And recognizing that the utilization of data in a data intensive era is a crucial issue for all the sciences, then to what, how do individual governments go about putting in place policies, mechanisms for support and stimulation that will ensure that their science base is able to engage on, in a developing international enterprise. Now, of course, if one looks, if we're referring back to Tony's talk, at those groups that have organized themselves immensely effectively in many cases on a disciplinary or quasi-disciplinary basis to exploit the data universe with which they confront and which have been to, to a very varying degree successful in persuading individual researchers in those domains that sharing data is of greater personal value to them uh, than simply hugging their data to their chest. But if one takes those excellent examples that Tony referred to, there's still a tremendous amount of science where, if you like, the ways of working where the presumption is the data's mine are, are, are still important and probably prevalent. And maybe that's the domain for national policies, in a sense, to get a, a more widespread, coherent view that these issues of data sharing are, are crucial. And if we're going to move into a, a, an era where we are going to be effective in exploiting this extraordinary enhancement of the capacity to, to acquire, to store, to manipulate, and to analyze, analyze data, then much more extensive data sharing is going to be needed. And of course, national governments also have their policies for their own information, 
and the use that might be made of it, and the question is how do the two interact? So there are a whole bundle of issues there, uh, and uh, I'll now pass over to, I think, first of all, Mark, and then uh, Claire and, and, and Rita to talk <coughs> about their national policies. Um, it, 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 perhaps I should say that what we're going to try to do is to have individuals speak for about five minutes or so, identifying key priorities for them. I'll then try to s summarize very briefly what those priorities have been, and then we'll try to have a, a discussion involving the audience in a pretty thorough fashion. Um, but rather than jumping about from issue to issue, we'll try to, be, try to address them one by one, and then at the end we'll see if we can come up some sort of summation, which might indeed be even helpful in the sorts of policies that are pursued subsequently. So after that rather windy introduction, Mark, off you go. Right. Uh, thank you, Geoffrey. So I assume, yeah, the microphone's on. So Geoffrey gave us the task of think, looking back 10 years to think about the achievements we'd made in our domains and looking forward for 10 years to think about what were going to be the, the new priorities and the challenges we're going to face. Um, unlike Tony, who um, couldn't find his slides from when he last spoke at the IDCC 10 years ago. <coughs> I actually have no recollection of speaking at all, which is even more embarrassing. <laughs> but anyone who know me will know that um, I struggle to remember what I said five minutes ago, let alone 10 years ago at times. Um, as Tony said, I work for Natural Environment Research Council, one of the seven UK research councils, um, where I have a role in overseeing the, the work of our network of data centres. I also, and there are a number of my research council colleagues here in the audience today, um, have been one of the people involved in the whole research council policy on open access to research publications, um, where I've actually been probably been spending more time recently working on the whole area of open access to publications rather than the research data side. Um, However, there is, I think as Tony alluded to, there is a lot of overlap between the two. And I think looking forward, that's probably going to be one of the areas where we will have to think more carefully, more about, I guess, it's what one publisher calls the article of the future. It's going to be very much around um, how we produce richer research outputs where you tie the, the paper to the data, to the underlying research materials in a much more cohesive fashion. But looking backwards <clears throat> over 10 years, it's, it's quite interesting. Some of the things I've been thinking about, I realised happened much more than 10 years ago. And actually, in terms of a lot of what I've been doing in data management, 10 years past isn't really that long a time. But I think then... One of the first things that strikes me is the drivers for why we were doing this were different. I think certainly in specific domains, um, I think about areas of atmospheric physics within environmental sciences or everyone talks about astronomy, there are certain scientific domains which even 10 years ago, 20 years ago, couldn't do their science without doing their data management effectively. But I think the drivers probably 10 years ago were much more around the concept of data as a public good. And we as funders needed to make sure people were looking after their data effectively because we recognised those data had a longer term value in many more areas of science than those traditional ones. I think looking forwards, to me, those drivers are changing. And we have to move on from just describing data as a public good to really recognising that data do have, many data have a reuse and repurposing value. But also this is whole area of moving towards the, the area of, I think, what Geoffrey highlighted in the report from the Royal Society, Science and Science Enterprise, this whole concept of um, what does research mean in a digital age? And it's, it's this whole area of, of um, in, a, in a networked world where um, anyone, in theory, can publish, in inverted commas, anything on the web, it really is beholden on all of us who are involved in the research process to ensure that not only the research papers, but the supporting data, the supporting information, are there to support our research in an open and transparent fashion. Because I think what, it, what the 
what to some extent what Google has showed us is that, um, and Bing also has shown us, is that if there's a void out there in the knowledge space, someone will fill it. Um, not necessarily with anything of any consequence. Um, so I think the drivers very much are changing, very much from just we need this because of policy because everyone else has done one, it's all about public good, to very much recognising we need a openness and access to data as one of the cornerstones of a modern research process in the digital world. Um, I think also... Um, the focus 10 years ago was more about funders. What are funders going to do about data? My own research council had a data policy. ESRC, the Economic and Social Research Council, had a data policy. Other research councils were start, were, at that point were starting to think about it. Whereas now we have all, in the UK, all the research councils have a data policy. We have our common principles across the councils. And now we're starting the process of thinking about can we actually harmonise on a common set of policy conditions, which in theory sounds a very easy thing to do. But as my colleagues know in practice, it is actually extremely complex across the disciplines. But we're still working that area. But I think going forwards, the focus is going to be very much on what is going to be the role of institutions. And again, Tony alluded to this when he was talking about who is the people, who's going to be paying to do the data management in future. And from my perspective, data management is basically going to become part of the provision of research infrastructures. And who pays the research infrastructures and who delivers research infrastructures. And it's a combined... <coughs> Um, it's a combined activity between the research funders and research institutions. And basically anyone who runs a research institution will be required, I see, if they're running a quality research institution, to deliver a good data management infrastructure because that's just part of the necessary infrastructure. It's what is known as a well-found lab. You know, you can't run a laboratory without the right equipment in place. We can't run research institutions without, in future, I would say, having appropriate data management infrastructures in place. I think once they're recognised in that way, then it becomes easier to almost to identify who provides the funding, because as funders, we are used to funding research infrastructure. I think I've probably had my five minutes, Geoffrey, so yeah. I will shut up. I think we can then applaud. Okay, Claire. Thanks. Um, so, in terms of achievement and, and looking back, I guess, over the last 10 years, I, I was um, very pleased uh, that Tony Hay covered most of what I might have said uh, in this session. It's nice to get a plug in for, for ANS uh, and for the RDA, uh, and it's nice for it not to be coming from someone with an Australian accent, so thank you. Um, it, it has been a big decade. Uh, the Australian government invested something in the order of 620 million Australian dollars between 2006 and now um, on e-research infrastructure. And picking up that, that last point, um, it, it is about the infrastructure and it's about the capability um, to deliver on the policies that governments and uh, research funders and scientists um, want to be able to deliver on. And so that that amount of money went into the full range of, of e-research um, infrastructure, so high-performance computing and networks. Um, but it also, 88-odd uh, million dollars of it went into, into the Australian National Data Service. Um, and we established ANS at a time when there had been this whole debate that all of you are well familiar with, more familiar than I am, around the cost of journals, the sort of crisis in scholarly publishing, um, arguments about the value of disseminating research, but very much focused on publications, very, very much focused on open access to publications. Uh, and we established ANS to have a different conversation um, that was about data and that was about the value of data, um, not as inputs and outputs of high-performance computing, um, but something different uh, and something that was much more varied and much more um, nuanced, if you like, and, and valuable in different kinds of ways. And we think that, that ANS has been a great success. Um, 
I guess the other thing that, that looking back uh, has happened in the Australian context in that period uh, is that our, we only have two funding councils, which simplifies things a little bit. Um, but both the Australian Research Council and the National Health and Medical Research Council have, um, over that period, um, come a long way towards um, making um, policy statements and writing into their funding rules um, very strong support for open access to publications and now very strong support for uh, data management plans um, and for researchers really needing to think hard at the beginning of, of their grant about what they're going to do with not only their publication but also their data. Um, and I guess what, what's significant um, in some of the most recent policy pronouncements out of the ARC in particular is not only do they, they require uh, a data management plan at the outset but, but that it covers all publication outputs including books. Um, and so I think that, that one of the reasons that it has taken a while for the ARC to formulate this is because uh, there has been pushback from humanities scholars, frankly. Um, we don't have data and we don't need to share it because we don't collaborate with anyone else. Uh, we go and sit in the library or the lab or the wherever and, and this is mine um, and I'm going to publish off this data until I die. Um, and so they appear um, to have made a policy decision that that's actually not okay with public money, uh, which I think is fantastic. Um, and the day that, that a really eminent uh, scholar in whatever discipline doesn't get their next grant because they didn't submit a data management plan or because they didn't um, think about where they were going to manage or store or disseminate their data um, will be the day that compliance rates go up. Um, we've been agitating for this for a very long time. Um, so the other things that I just wanted to say quickly, so that's, that's sort of you know, what we've done, I guess, in the, in the Australian context. We also, um, in the context of our research assessment exercise, which is called uh, Excellence for Research in Australia, um, the government provided funding to universities for digital repositories um, because one of the big barriers um, to getting anything online or, or um, made available in open access so it was that there wasn't the infrastructure. So the infrastructure is now there um, for publications and for data. Um, and at some level it's been about just pushing through the barriers um, to open access. You can have the policies if you haven't got the infrastructure, it doesn't happen and, and vice versa. So we think we've, um, we've made some pretty good progress. I guess in the, in the next little while, um, it'll be about bedding down those ARC and NHMRC policies and seeing how they actually play out, um, particularly on the data side, um, and continuing to support universities and other institutions in, in making their research data assets shareable, reusable and discoverable, uh, which, which ANS has been doing a good deal of, um, but which will need to really continue um, in order to make these policies actually have any, any real traction. Thank you. Thank you. Rita. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. I'm very happy to be here for the first time uh, in this interesting conference. And my background, as I said, I'm, I'm working in a government level, international policy level, so I look for this as a science policy point of view. And in Finland, we have a target which I know many other countries also have to have our science more higher quality, more efficiently produced, and higher impact for society and whole. And this is a point of view where we start discussing the, the issue. In the last 10 years, uh, I must say, we first developed a lot of infrastructures, uh, computing, uh, cloud services, and so on. And only in 2010, we actually had a paper which was a research data guide for policymakers, which said that something should be done also by government level. And that uh, resulted a project, initiative, National Research Data Initiative, which was run until 2013. And in that, uh, services were built for data sharing, data preservation, sharing, publishing, and also data management guide. And the good outcome was that actually also Academy of Finland, which is a research council, in a way, uh, also now asks for data management plan for researchers. Um, I believe that they know that the name. The content uh, might be different, but anyway, they now think about what is this data management plan, and that's a good thing. And uh, we also have been developing a lot of EU infrastructures and also more coherence for infrastructure policy in Finland. So all this has happened in line with discussions in Finland uh, to be more open in general also, in open government and so on. 
So after this uh, research data and Steve was finished in 2013, we were sitting down and said, should we continue or not? And if we continue, how? And there were two main lessons. First one was that actually we shouldn't focus only on data. We should also tackle the open access issues, but also the methods. And now we have this new initiative, which is Open Research, Science and Research Initiative, which has data, methods, and results, or uh, publications. And this is why we think that it's really the whole cycle of, of the research cycle. When you start planning your new project, when you store, you collect data, when you use metadata catalogs, you, you work with it, you license it some way, and you publish it somewhere. And then you have to learn throughout the whole process, how you are supporting that one, both in national level and organizational level. And the reason we want to have this whole cycle involved in our planning and discussion is that we have learned in Finland that actually the open science, or open data, open access was actually a lot of uh, by individuals, interested individuals who were very much fond of that, who found it's very useful for their research, but it was no way engaged with any strategies of organizations who are funding or who are actually doing the research. And we found it's very, very sensitive, it's very difficult if we don't really take up the whole cycle and at the same time highlight the responsibilities of all actors. So we want to go beyond good and enthusiastic individuals to the whole country level, whole organizational level in this new strategies and new way of working. At the same time, we also have acknowledged that its plurality is important. So we have different disciplines. You cannot have one model fits all. And it's also plurality is that it's not all open for everybody. It's, it's not black and white. So we have to have a gradual way how we can ensure that researchers, when they start, work the way, on a routine way, that they can open data if it's needed for publication, for the research funder, for whatever needs and also that they think the whole openness as their daily business. As they now use computers, they will be, in next decade, very, very routinely working with open access, open science, open data, and open methods. So this is where we're aiming now. And uh, to do that, we actually have three success key, key issues we have to do. It's, first of all, it's a joint operating model. This is not something one ministry can do. This is really ministries, these universities, it's research funders, it's many associations we have, and we have also CEC, IT Center for Science. So we need all of these players together to work with and to, to go together for the same goal. And that's what we are now building in the system, to, to make it together on a networked way. The second one is that everybody has a different role. As a government, we are in line and we are in charge to provide guidance for national level discussions. We are there to prevent um, or to, to develop a sustainable system, whether it's long-term preservation, open access, we have to have a sustainable system which works for Finnish so scientific society. Research funders need to support open access, open data, open methods in their funding results, and we had nice examples from Australia. And research organizations are something which we are now actually having most difficulties, if I would say. We have to find a way that research organizations find this beneficial for them to work with whether it's data, data scientists or librarians or researchers, every organization has to have the open science in their strategies, how they are going to handle it, how they're going to support the research system that it actually can take the best benefits of open science. And also how they use librarians, for instance, as was mentioned in a keynote speak. And then we have researchers. They had to acknowledge that it takes resources to plan the data management and to save the data, to curate the data. And it's, it's important to take note for citations and source of data in their own publications. <laughs> so all of that is, is important, that we have different roles. And then, uh, as a small country, very far away, no, two hours flight from not London, actually, but very far from, even, from many other countries, we uh, push all these different groups to work internationally. So it's not international by government, but it's international by government also, by researchers, by data analysts, and all the people. And then we pull their ideas, what they learned, when they work internationally together, to bring new discussions, new solutions, new problems also sometimes. So that's the second issue. And the third is, is really the aim. So we want to change the culture and to make open science as a daily routine. That's really the target. And we know it cannot take place by, by decision, of a minister, but it's really a decision that we work together to make it a real thing. 
And therefore, we believe that it's not anymore only believers who will talk, but also other ones will talk together and will find a way how this will be benefiting them and to watch what step they will take, how they are wise in their openness. So that's the achievement we have there. So uh, we have lots of hopes. Uh, we also have a project running, and uh, so far it has been very good discussions. We have a lot of uh, questions raised for legal issues, for practical issues, for long-term preservation, and so on. But we are quite sure we can achieve that together with national discussions and international discussions. Mm, good one. Uh, I've been furiously scribbling, trying to capture some of the a relatively small number of major issues that I think have come through. I think Mark made the assertion, these are my words, not his, that uh, we can see a change taking place at the moment where we're moving from, or at least in some countries and some disciplinary areas, moving from a culture of compliance where the Research Council says, you must do this. If you don't do it, then we won't continue to fund you. And the question is, can we move from that to a situation where both researchers and their institutions feel that it's in their interests and indeed their responsibility to work in this way simply because it's much more efficient and effective and hopefully effective in two ways. First of all, in doing more and better science. And secondly, of course, uh, uh, appealing to the natural interest of researchers and their own careers. Um, it was interesting that uh, beforehand, when Rita and I were talking, she said, well, one of the problems, of course, we get all this data being, being put into our data banks, and she didn't say this when she was speaking, but, but a lot of it's rubbish. And actually what she meant was it's unusable. And indeed, I, I remember my, my, the research council, from which I'm a client, for more than 10 years now, 15 years actually, has been requiring me to deposit my data. And I used to do exactly that. Just say, here you are, take it. It was quite unusable. But I think now most of it, many of us at least, now take a much more responsible view of that. Um, if I can then move on to what I think is an associated issue, and that is the question of funding. Who's going to fund all this? And I think it's crucially important to have a, a mindset which sees the appropriate curation and selection of data as, the cost, as part of the cost of doing research. Uh, there's a false dichotomy that says, well, you can either do research and do good research, or you could spend some money on, on curating the data. And actually, that's, that's an argument which ought to be dead. We're talking about doing science well, and the cost of curation, all these other things, ought to be part of the cost of doing research. Um, one of the panel mentioned, I think it was Mark mentioned, the issue of what's it going to be like? What is it already like in some domains? And what is it generally going to be like to be a researcher in a digital age? And in some ways, I think here, one has to look from the, from the perspective of the individual researcher and ask the question, is there a narrative which we could produce for the individual researcher which explains to them in ways they would understand and approve of how sorts of systems we're discussing are going to be personally beneficial to them. What's it going to be like? We almost need a, a journalist to sit down and take evidence from us and tell us you know, what it would look like to be a researcher in 10 or 15, 15 years' time. Um, one of the other issues is the, the roles of different bodies. I mean, Rita talked about the role of government. Where, where was the role of government? And in fact, if one looks at the actors in research systems, it's potentially government, and, and the Australian government, for example, has taken a very, took a very strong view to say, this is the future, we're going to fund it. Uh, the role of research councils, uh, the role of institutions, um, the role of learned societies, which to a large degree define some of the principles and priorities of the disciplines. And of course, the responsibilities of individual, re individual researchers. Uh, another issue, which is a difficult issue, I think, is the, are we talking largely about the natural sciences and those areas of the social sciences which um, are concerned primarily with longitudinal data, or, are we, or, or is this an issue for the humanities as well? Well, it's rather clear that in some areas it is an issue for the humanities. I mean, interestingly, one of the first and most powerful uh, demonstrations 
of the utility of utilizing data in the humanities was something like 30 years ago when a French historian called Leroy Ladurie showed how you could use proxy taxation information to infer the progression of climate. And indeed, there are many areas in the humanities that are picking that up too. But one of the things we have to worry about is that many processes and procedures which are well adapted to the natural sciences are often foisted on areas of the social sciences and the humanities without regard to the real nature of the intellectual exercise with which they're involved. So, for instance, the pressure for people in the humanities in the UK because of our research excellence framework to publish papers rather than write books in other words, publish papers that one and a half people will read rather than write the books that are going to sell 20,000 copies. I mean, that's not an intelligent way to go. And we have to be very sensitive to the distinctive ways in which different, different areas of, of scholarship work. And I think for me, the last one, the, 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 the last big issue, in a sense, goes back to the slide that Tony showed of, of the late, great Jim Gray's uh, concept that we should look forward to an imminent, possibly an imminent period, when all the publications open and online, and all the data is open and online, and the two interoperate. I mean, that's an achievable aspiration of something I think which we should work towards. So I think those are some of the certainly big issues that came from the came from the panel. So let me ask you, the audience, is there anything that's big that we've missed that isn't contained within that? Yes. I'll wait for the. Um, yeah. The mic is coming at high speed down the... <laughs> Hi, that was a great panel. It's Liz Lyon, University of Pittsburgh now. Um, I just wanted to raise the issue of credit, attribution and incentives. And, and that's for not just the um, researcher who creates the data, but also for the curators and managers, that family of data science roles. Uh, that add value to the data. So, so that's something I'd like to put on the table. And the, the one other thing, if I may, uh, is education. Uh, so I'm now faculty at University of Pittsburgh um, educating people about data. Uh, and that's um, potential researchers and potential data scientists in all those um, flavours of data science. Uh, so I'd like to add that onto the table uh, as well. It's interesting that, um, I mean, coming back to Jim Gray again, I remember one of his comments some, some while ago was that uh, we scientists do terrible things with our data. We should be ashamed of ourselves and the awful things we do with it. Not only in the, 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 the invalid statistical manipulation, but in many other domains. And I think that you know, here education is a key, as you imply. Any other first order issues that we've missed so far that we need to pick up? Tony, down here and then, then over here. Yes, yes, Jeffrey. It's just to bring up again. You see, I, I actually like libraries, university research libraries, but I think they are no longer central to the operation of a university at the moment, and I think they need to reorganise what they do. And uh, the role of a subject librarian actually needs to change. So there is some funding there for this, and they need to work with scientists. And I think, therefore, the role of research libraries. Uh, is something that needs to be on the agenda of every vice chancellor of the universities and, and the librarians. They need to think carefully about what their role should be because there is a budget there mm. and exactly mm. what they do with their budget and people is, is a choice. Mm. Uh, I mean, on that point, it's interesting to look back over 30 years when about 25, 20, 30 years ago, we lost our lovely little departmental libraries, when, uh, where, which is where we put our wet towels after we'd been playing squash and, and the librarian would look after us. And it was the heart and soul of the department. And then, damn it, the bureaucrats in the middle for managerial and financial reasons said, no, 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 you must lose your departmental libraries and we'll put them in these magnificent new buildings and, and the like. And maybe, actually, the time has come for that trend to reverse. In other words, to push out from the library to get into support capacities within the various disciplinary areas. But yes, next one. Just thank you very much for the, the talks. They were great. I just wanted to pick up on the data management planning issue. And we heard from Tony's talk that uh, compliance is going up. People are writing the plans, but are they actually making the science better? And I'm not entirely sure at the moment they are. And I'm wondering if there is a role for the funding bodies instead of 
only mandating the plans to be produced at the, <coughs> the grant application stage, should we start putting pressure at the end of the project to have a retrospective view, a data management plan that is published and made available for uh, people to look at and to understand how the data was handled and, and processed during the active phase? Yes, I mean, that, that strikes me as really going to the heart of what we're talking about, that uh, all these data management plans, all these systems and the like, are they creating better science? Are we getting more bang for buck? And how would we know? It's, uh, you, know you can't do a double-blind test on it. Um, hello, uh, Peter Burnhill, University of Edinburgh, Adena, um, once upon a time, DCC. Um, I'd like to make two points, if I may. Um, one is this business about what is the job of a research library, and I would argue that the essential task is to ensure ease and continuity of access to stuff that we need. And that needs reinterpreting, perhaps, but that's the task. We don't necessarily have to look for new tasks. That is the task, because if librarians don't do that, I'm not sure where it's going to be, because it's not on the shelves, it's somewhere else. The second point I'd like to make and put on the table, so to speak, is the, the value of metadata should be to help us integrate material together. So I'd like to put the spatial metadata tag in on the table. <laughs> Because a very large part of what we collect and generate as data is spatially or temporally referenced. And that brings things together for context, makes it more discoverable, and is actually a value add that we have to invest in order that we can find it at some later stage. Yeah, just comment on the first one, I think. I mean, I, I would take the view that the historical role of the library over the last almost 1,000 years and more uh, remains constant. What's been happening is that technology has been changing. And as the technology has been changing, the way in which you serve the ancient end, which is making knowledge accessible, available, and usable, has to change too. And the question now is, how do we maintain that historical role in the modern age? Are there any other sort of first order comments? Or can, we, can we, yes, right at the back. Hello, my name is Molly Bompain. I'm from US Army Europe. And I'm coming from the museum archive history side. And something that you said in this, this panel said, and it was mentioned before, is about the quality of the data that you're getting and how, with, when, it's, when it's submitted, how do you control, like, like from our side, it's a collection policy. And we have challenges from data coming downrange from the military history detachment teams. And how do you get them to give you what you want so you're not curating rubbish, as you said? So I think that's why, I mean, the challenge all of us face and our challenge of being, um, challenge of being relevant to today, you know, to our, whoever pays us. And, um, but it's the idea of collecting and how do you, how do you get good data because it's expensive to curate, so. Yeah. I mean, I think there's an interesting uh, conjunction there. I mean, I, I work on, I do seismic work on the Antarctic ice sheet. And I have to say, some of the most interesting data I have is rubbish. Um, and one has to balance two things. One is importance, what is the, What's the intrinsic value of the information that you're acquiring? And secondly, how complete and well understood from a technical perspective is the data? And often the two don't work well together. You know, very often, if you, you, land a, 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 you, you put a, a lander on a comet uh, and you lose six hours of data. Um, uh, what do you do? You say, well, poor data. Well, actually, it'll cost another 15 million quid to put another lander up. So. Uh, and I think that this, this uh, it goes back to an issue which, which several people raised about how do we go about selecting what to, what, what to, what to save and under what circumstances. And I think it's, it's, it's something that needs to be explored more and more, particularly for uh, as universities and institutes become more involved in the process of being responsible for the data and the information they produce, then what, sort of, what are the sort of standards and procedures and protocols they need to adopt? And indeed, it seems to me there ought to be some international agreement about that, largely because I depend on data that comes from California, from Bremen, for all over the place. And if we all have different standards about what it is we should retain, then it become, the whole business of doing science as an international enterprise starts to be, starts to be, to be undermined. Can I just uh, now, now stop talking for a bit? Uh, I think we've, we've cantered over the terrain pretty well. And I, I think what I would like to do, first of all, is to go back to an issue that Mark first raised, and which I mentioned, and that is that maybe things are changing, that we're shifting from uh, a culture of compliance 
um, where we are required to submit data management plans, required to submit our data and the, and the like, to ones where we see reasons for doing it, both individually as researchers, but also as institutions. I mean, is that process taking place? And do we need to enhance it? And how would we like to go about doing that? I mean, what's actually happening at the moment? Would anyone like to sort of seize upon this? Yes. Um, just here. Hello, I'm, I'm Ben Ryan from EPSRC. Um, as Marcus said, you know, one of seven research councils, we all have our separate data policies. Ours is couched in terms of a framework of expectations, and we don't require data management plans with any grant application. Um, we're not quite sure what we would do with them if they were submitted to us, and we don't want to add to the burden of peer review by having to ask for them. On the other hand, we made it clear four years ago almost when we published our expectations that, um, and this is in common with the RCUK principles, uh, data management plans should be in place for all projects, and we see it clearly as an institutional responsibility to make sure that they are there. And do you think that's a wiser route than the requirement at application stage of having a data management plan in place? I, I think it's interesting that th the question is asked, why do funders not require this? If funders make it clear that they should be in place, why are institutions unable to require it themselves? Mm -hmm. And it gets back to this change in the, mm -hmm. in the, um, the culture where uh, there's growing or greater recognition that institutions have responsibilities in this space. Um, I, was, I, I think the idea that maybe there should be a requirement to publish a data management plan at the end of a project rather than the beginning is quite an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, just behind. Thanks. Anna Clements, University of St Andrews. And I'd like particularly to respond to Ben's point because we've had this discussion before about the fact that EPSRC don't require a data management plan. It's, it's, a, it's an analogy. If you look at open access, for example, which has been going on for a lot longer than open data, then really in the UK, the open access policies of the HEFC REF 2020 um, requirement has accelerated deposit of open access articles because the researchers know that if they don't deposit the articles uh, with, um, <coughs> within three months of acceptance, then it, the, these articles won't be referable. So there is a stick there, as well as a growing understanding from a cultural point of view that it's, it's, good, f it's good for um, science and for, for uh, research in general. So my argument to Ben would be EPSRC, please do require a data management plan at this stage because it will get the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. And I think it's important because some of our researchers, our chemists and so on, when they don't, they realise they don't have to submit the data management plan at, um, when they're entering, when they're requesting a grant, won't do it. So although, whereas the other research councils who do insist on it, then they will do it. And although it's almost a sort of compliance tick the box exercise at the moment, it will become, I think, and help the culture change. Can I, can I seize on you as a representative of universities then? I'm sure you are. Um, what, what is it that is changing the perspective of universities? Is it because they are required <coughs> to change the way they work in relation to the data outputs? Or is it because they see benefit in doing better research from doing so? I think it's, it's a bit of each, really. But I think with universities, they have so many requirements um, hoisted onto them with policy change and so on. And open access, particularly in the UK, because of the HEFSI policy, is the key thing and uppermost in their mind. It's almost how, what they can concentrate on at any one time. So I think if you have a clear policy from the funders that this is a re requirement, then that will help to boost um, the, the policy change at the university level. Mm. That would be my view. I mean, it does depend on the university and how much resource they have and so on as well. But that would be my view that the f what the funders require is key to driving the strategy at the university. Mm. At this stage, where we are in the curve, if you like, for data management in particular. Mm. I don't know whether others would agree mm. with that or not. 
Um, on this question of whether um, data management plan should be part of the funder process or whether they should be an institutional requirement, I think you can make a pretty strong argument on two grounds that they really ought to be called for by the funders as an integral part of the, um, the grant selection and award process. One is that um, to the extent that you believe that peer review is a good mechanism for um, evaluating grants and deciding which ones should be funded, um, it's very hard for me to see um, why some consideration of what data will be made public and what the data outcomes of a research project um, uh, are intended to be should not be part of that peer review process. Um, I also think even beyond that, going to culture change, um, that making those, um, making those proposals visible within the discipline and actually generating discussions about what's worth keeping and what isn't and for how long um, really, really helps with the deeper disciplinary culture change. Now, I, I've also got to qualify that by um, saying that I do not know at present of any instance where a grant was turned down uh, by peer, or, or rated poorly by peer reviewers um, because of what was in the data plan, data management plan. Um, certainly, you can see instances where, you know, the grant submission system uh, rejected a grant um, submission because there was no data management plan attached. But I think we're still at really the very early stages of um, seeing um, proposal evaluation engage that um, data management plan in a serious way. Um, I also think that there are some issues about the role of host institutions, the universities themselves, in following up on compliance with the data management plan and helping, helping um, uh, researchers to actually do what they said they would do. Um, but that's kind of a separate yeah. matter. Um, but I do think that's an important role for the host institutions going forward. So while we're talking about sticks, not carrots, um, then what about the role of publishers? Uh, I mean, it seems to me that uh, a actually <coughs> fundamental principle of science in the last 200, 300 years has been that you make your data, that is the evidence, concurrently available with a thesis which is derived from it. And the reason for doing that, of course, is that it permits others to scrutinize the evidence for your conclusions. And I would argue that it's by far the most powerful form of peer review, much more powerful than, than pre-publication peer review. And shouldn't then publishers require the evidence to be there in a way that is scrutinizable? Could I just Peter. add to your publishers one other role, which is that of editor? Mm -hmm. Because I think publishers and publishing is a business in its own yeah. right, like selling yeah. other things and providing other things. But we're talking about the editorial process, yeah. which might be supported elsewhere. Yeah. Jeffrey, yes, if I could comment on that. Um, one of the little overlooked things in the Research Council's policy in open access when it came out in 2013 was the requirement for all papers under Research Council funding to now carry a statement on access to the underlying research materials, <clears throat> be that data, samples, specimens, whatever. We haven't, as research funders, haven't pressed on the implementation of that part of the policy yet, but it has led some really interesting discussions with publishers around this about how can they build into their publication workflows the need for some form of data statement in every research paper. It could say, you know, the data aren't actually available. You know, I've lost them. You could actually, that's a perfectly legitimate statement. Or well, they're on a memory stip in the bottom of a filing cabinet in the corner of the office, or they were till I moved offices five years ago. But when that goes to peer review, hopefully the peer review panel, peer reviewers of that paper would then actually say, well, actually, if they can't even put their hands on the data, this isn't, can't be that good a paper. But from my perspective, talking to publishers, a lot of them are starting to engage with this. 
Um, but I think it's, it goes to, to maybe to part of a, a deeper question, which others have alluded to, and it's very much peer reviewers, you know, when say, well, funders should do this or journals should do that, at the end of the day, they are a representation of the research community at large. You know, our councils, our review panels with us, funders are basically members of our research communities. Mm -hmm. So it's how, at the end of the day, I think we build that in almost into the warp and weft, the fabric of doing research, mm -hmm. that data just becomes part mm -hmm. of the second nature of what we do mm -hmm. and how we manage it in a modern digital world. One last, one last question, then let's move on, shall we? Yeah, oh. Simon Hodgson, co-data. Um, what I was going to say really ties in with, what, with the comment from Peter, that it's very much about editorial boards and from Mark about the role of peer review. <laughs> I wanted to bring us back to something that very important that Rita said, that this is about the way that research reporting, not reporting about research, so the way we res report what has been done in the research is transformed in the digital age. And to do that in this age of open science, open methods, and open data, we need to report on precisely those things. What software has been used and where is it? what data has been used and where is it and how. And this is the evolution of scientific and, and, and research method. And to oversee that, clearly funders have a role, institutions have a role, but there's an essential role for learned societies or international scientific unions or whatever organisations we have, communities we have, that speak for researchers and their practice and advocate, this is how we do our collective practice. And that, those are, that's where that discussion about how we do this reporting to bring in the data has, has to happen, I think. Mm -hmm. um, one last question, or one last comment. So um, the Association for Computing Machinery has a committee about what should be in the ACM digital library besides PDFs. And the answers are supposed to be data and software. And the problem is, who is going to referee that? Because mm -hmm. checking that some deposited piece of software doesn't contain a virus, or checking that these data are actually useful and give the results in the paper, is far more demanding than yeah. what referees usually do. Yeah. And we don't have an answer. We also, by the way, don't know how to catalog the results. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just, I mean, I recognise the, 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 the difficulty of the, the, the issue. I just wonder whether this distinction between, if you like, pre-publication peer review and post-publication peer review is the crucial one, that uh, increasingly given the demands on reviewers, I mean, I, I would say that the, certainly it applies to me, that I was much more rigorous in providing reviews 20, 30 years ago than I am now, partially because of the storm of, of, of requests that comes my way. But... Where, where a conclusion is important, and it's perceived to be important by the scientific community, I would say that, certainly in my domain, I'm sure many others, that um, uh, like clouds of hornets, we all descend on the argument and the data and pull it apart in a fierce sort of way. And that's a crucial issue. It becomes much more difficult, of course, when software is involved, where you don't have access not only to the software, but the way in which the software has been, been utilised. But it seems to me that post-publication review is a crucial exercise. And, I mean, Charles Darwin, uh, usually a good reference to quote, commented that uh, false ideas are not a problem because we, uh, we take a particular delight in tearing them apart. False facts, however, he, he said, are really serious because they are lo they're long sustained and can di divert the, the, the progress of science. And I would say that actually putting your data in is part of the false ideas bit. And that's what we ought to be good at demolishing. I mean, there are an awful lot of stuff that's published. No one would ever dream of wanting to look in detail at the, at the, at the underlying data, largely because what they're trying to say is either trivial or not terribly, not terribly important. So, I mean, this is a very messy business. You know, I, I think what, one of the things we have to recognise is that we're not, somehow we're not trying to produce a perfect system but we're trying to produce a system that more or less works. And the big question, I think, is how do we adapt that system so that it will continue to more or less work in an era where we have vast data volumes and vast data complexity? 
Could we, could we move on now? Um, what I'd like to do is to pick up two issues that were raised from the aud audience. One was about the library and the role of the library, and the other one was about education, because it seems to me that to some degree the two are related. What are we going to do about our libraries? I mean, if you are a senior university administrator, the thought of having a library staff of 120, 150 people whose skills are not the skills that are required by the sort of things we've been discussing, these large and expensive buildings in the middle of your campus, I mean, the problems are severe. How important is the issue of the library? Is it a major challenge for university institutes? Yes. I thought we were going, going to have one of these terrible silences for a moment. Hi, uh, I'm Suni from Singapore. Uh, I'm from the Nanyang Technological University. I'm a librarian. Um, since you're asking about um, um, the role of libraries and you know what what they do to um, uh, adapt and uh, uh, to move towards this uh, digital curation age, perhaps I'd like to share a little bit about what we have done here. Um, we actually did some reorg. And uh, we we had uh, identified a few people to look into data management, and uh, we have got ourselves uh, to work closely with the Office of Research and together with the IT department of the university. And uh, in fact, talking about DMPs, uh, we don't have uh, any DMP requirement in Singapore. We don't have any requirements from the Singapore government or the funding agencies, but uh, we have just come up with a proposal uh, which is not yet approved but still in the pipeline to get all the researchers in our university to do a DMP. Um, as for making the DMPs public or not, I think um, we would like to take baby steps first uh, because the concept of DMP, data management, data curation is still very new in Singapore. So uh, we thought uh, for a start, we would like to um, uh, get people be aware about DMPs and the senior management is very supportive, in fact, about uh, having this uh, an institutional requirement. Um, there were questions from researchers because we did a few of um, uh, individual uh, interviews with researchers and they, they, did, they do have some reservations about um, the need to fill up DMPs and whether it's worth their while. Um, we have uh, the support uh, from the Research uh, Integrity Office. So uh, this is a newly set up office and um, they they were the ones who um, start looking at uh, preserving research records. And that's when, uh, you know, at some of these meetings, the library got a foot in mm -hmm. and um, started to share about DMPs, data curation, open data, et cetera. So that, that got them very excited. And so that's where we are now um, to um, moving towards having DMPs as a, an, uh, a university-wide requirement, mm -hmm. um, but taking baby steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Peter Blanell, you, you, you brought this up. I mean, are there any models for the library of the current age? I feel like being put on the spot. You are, you are. <laughs> <clears throat> we normally expect that the person who asks the question has got the answer, so. Just to begin, um, so as a researcher, I once went for a job and I got the job because they asked me what a data library was and I said it's a bit like intergalactic library loan. <laughs> Unfortunately, they laughed and I got the job. Um, now, I think it's a question myself about how you regard library as a sort of portmanteau label for a set of tools, but with that principle in mind we referred to earlier. So if an academic research library doesn't actually look after the scholarly record and think it's its job, and then nobody else is going to. Hmm. And so there are things to do with the fuzzy edge of that scholarly record. As we know, it's not as simple as it used to be to take well-published stuff and put it on a shelf. Um, 
And we used to have simple definitions where there were some holdings libraries, but we also accepted that there were lots of libraries who couldn't be that. They were access libraries. Now, unfortunately, we seem to behave as though everybody's an access library. And we have, we have done very well on the ease of access to stuff. But people have forgotten that our shelves are, not, are no longer full of the stuff that they used to be, namely that scholarly record. So we have to actually try harder. And we have to try harder together because there is an international interdependence on that. We have to agree on our division of labor. So the, the two things that I would say are the job of a research library are firstly to take care of what we think is the scholarly record, because nobody else will do that unless we do that. And secondly, to do our best to ensure that the access to resources that we need for our scholarship is done well, but know that we can never do that ourselves alone. We have to work with others. Um, and maybe we work with others in a way in which we ensure some things that we need, which we think that somebody else might fail to do, because it's important. But otherwise, we cannot hope as research libraries to cope with all of the stuff that there is everywhere, whether they are the new form of government documents or the new form of newspapers, or we could go on to the other things that we used to do as research libraries. So we have to find ways of working on that larger thing. But we should never, never, never forget that if we don't look after the scholarly record, then there will be future scholars who will rubbish our name. So there you are, you asked me. Does everyone agree with Peter that if the libraries don't look after it, nobody will? Is that a... Tony? Well, let's have Tony first, then, then come in. Peter, I absolutely agree that the job of the library is to look after the, the research library, is to look after the research output of the university and the scholarly record. But what I was arguing was, now that all the journals are electronic, there's very much less for them to do. They don't need to shelving. They don't need shelving space. So what is the space, that beautiful library in the middle, why it's expensive building that the administrators have to figure out how to pay for? And... All the people who used to you know, help people find things, well, now you have search engines which are really efficient. So you do need to rethink the role. I'm not saying that they're, they're, they're not doing the scholarly record, but the scholarly record is more complex and there's a different role to be done than has been traditionally done. And there really is a need to change. Just comment that my, my students uh, regard the library as the place which has the money to fund the subscriptions to journals. That's it. They don't darken its premises. But... Uh, Hi, my name is uh, Christy Wiley, and I'm an engineering research and data services librarian at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Uh, with regard to the role of the library, I think there is a role of the library for uh, research data management. I think its role is varied depending on which institution you're at because there are factors that are involved in that. For example, what's the uh, is there campus support for that? Um, I recently participated in an e-research peer mentoring group. Um, they, I think it was with CLEAR, and I don't, I think it's Council of Library Information Research. Hope I got that acronym right. But it was a group including myself, the research data science director that they newly hired at our university, the life sciences librarian that also specializes in data, and other universities. And it seems to be that there are some universities that they're assisting uh, faculty members with their data management plans and beyond that, as well as the role of the uh, institutional repository in helping uh, the faculty and research researchers deposit their data, whereas some uh, other universities have problems with getting funding or getting campus support or getting people to see librarians beyond the role of the book. And I do think some people still have that uh, perspective that we're collectors and we are that, but there are other librarians that do more than that. For example, in my job, some of the things that I've been doing are working with physics and uh, engineering faculty beyond the data management plan and talking about how we can help them with their entire da data life cycle. Uh, but I think some of the issues in that are creating awareness that they know we're there to do that or that we can even do that, as well as engagement. Because oftentimes, when, they come, when we write them and say, hey, we know that you applied for this grant and we can offer these services to help you, they're like, oh, I didn't get the grant. 
so helping them um, understand that we can help them for their existing data continues to be something that we work on. Thank you. Okay. Mark wants to comment, and then so we'll cover it, hands up here. To me, it's also, it's not in the fit, well, rather than saying what's the future for library, it's more around what's the future for services the library provides. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, Jeffrey, you were on to a point there when you talked about, you know, you used to have the old departmental library where you hung your towel out to dry. In, in the sense that research teams need to build the concept of information and data science into those research teams. We see it in some domains. So we have the bioinformaticians in, in, in biology mm -hmm. are well established. But in other domains, we're still developing the concept of what does a an information scientist, say, in ecology, look like? What is their role? And it's this overlap between what was the historic role, I think, of the librarians, into, as Peter was articulating, around <clears throat> provision of that continuity of access and maintenance of the research record, which I think will now move, to some extent, within to the research teams itself themselves where you know you actually have expertise embedded within the team whether they're part of a library function whether they're part of the research team i'm not clear but it's it's part of that whole set of functions which maybe in the past were delivered through a building called the library will now be delivered through an information team which spans the research space mm -hmm. yes yeah. I'm Renata Ruvilius, uh, Swedish University of uh, Life Sciences. And actually, so I agree with everything that's what's said, but in <laughs> this way, that somebody has to take care of it. But it doesn't have to be a data uh, library, data research library. It also might be, or, or uh, data archives. It must be someone. And uh, during the break, I mentioned to the Kevin that we met actually for the first time at the university uh, here in London, in the Imperial College. And it was a seminar, a joint seminar with researchers, with archivists, uh, with librarians and, and ITC people. And actually, this is what I think. So uh, it must be perhaps uh, quite a new unit within the universities or other uh, organizations uh, that is a joint uh, concern of different working groups. And uh, we are talking about uh, uh, open access. Uh, and we are talking about digital creation. So uh, open access to data, good. Uh, but you must rely on this data set that are out there. And to rely on that, you, have, you must have this data management plan and you must guarantee that, that, that uh, this, the science is reliable. And actually, it is the interest of, of the scientists, the, the researchers. And um, uh, that the founders are demand, demanding a data management plan is very good because somebody has to pay for, for, for digital creation. So this is well, perhaps a new unit. We are creating at the university a, a unit called a DCU, Digital Creation Unit. And there are librarians, there are ITC people, there are researchers and archivists. Thank you very much. Then, over here, then we'll move on a little. Sorry, go on. Hi, John Williams, uh, Newcastle University. I think Mark made a point that which certainly is reflected at um, our institution, which is this link between the library and the research office, and uh, that's very important. We've worked for years, and it also harks back to a point that was made over here earlier about compliance, which is often seen as a sort of boring or kind of dirty word, in the, in, in, but actually it leads to really interesting developments. For In our institution, for instance, our technical services team in the library have been working for years on things like RE submission and REF submission, improving bibliographic data, and working with open access. And so what we've ended up with is a group within the library that previously were very much seen as a back office function, have more, have, have, have really meaningful interaction with both the research office and researchers, and have grown in that role. And I think the overlap between the research office because of things like compliance, because of there's an open access thing from Hefke, there's, a, there's a, the research data management uh, expectations and so on, you actually get people from the library engaging with researchers in a really significant way because of what researchers do on a day-to-day -day basis and understanding where they're coming from. And that has really developed in our place. The other point I just want to make just slightly is we shouldn't lose, fact of the, uh, shouldn't lose sight of the fact that libraries do other things as well. 
and uh, we're having to expand into other buildings because our library is so popular because students like to go there. So, you know, libraries do have other functions that we serve as well as this. Yeah, it's, they call us soft armchairs and, and coffee machines, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Rita read, first. Yeah. Thank, we'll you you. Uh, um, thank you very much. Thank you for Let's have Rita first, then we'll come back to you. Okay, sorry. Thank you very much. And actually, I'd like to continue exactly what you said. Because when we discuss uh, library role, uh, role of libraries in this issue in Finland, they always say, but we have students. And they not only come for coffee, they actually are hopefully coming for open data, open publications to make the, the graduation studies or, or make any, any way of, of searching data. They are trained to search data by many librarians at the moment. So this is something we sometimes forget when we focus so much on research and, and innovation part. And that is something which I try to remember myself also because it has been discussed so much. But I think that actual researchers, uh, what is important and it's actually linked to the education part that when people... Uh, learning what open science, open data, open access are, many scientists become frustrated. It's, it's scaring, it takes time, and you should expand your expertise. And there comes this idea that actually what, what Tony was showing, this, this pyramid, that we actually have also other disciplines involved and appreciate their work. And therefore, I think that it, it goes beyond um, uh, to look only from library point of view how they should change. It also goes for institution, how they should change, how they build up their groups, how they build up this joint expertise. And, and therefore, actually, it goes back to this previous discussion that it's in, the organizations are fundamentally important to, to provide education and training and to show how you need different disciplines. We don't want to every professor to be the best librarian. That's not the point. Um, just picking up on the part that point that Mark had made and Rita's I think probably built on there is that in doing research in a digital environment one of the dilemmas we have is that it's not is that research needs to take place in different ways and you need to involve a number of people from across different disciplines and different skill sets in order to be able to support it in different ways. One of the things that intrigues me about working with libraries and I should uh, work in a library at the University of Hull is that we then start imposing the paradigm that the library is a building uh, which has a particularly set uh, a set of roles and activities um, and it strikes me it's useful in how libraries can support digital research is by thinking about how what a library is in a digital concept we already think about digital libraries in terms of e-journal access which is very much um, outside the institution across institutions how do we think about what the role of a library is um, above the institution in terms of how it supports digital curation generally Kevin. So I have a question really for each of the panel uh, to think about as, as, as funders. We've heard quite a bit about the, the statements that have come <coughs> from international organizations, uh, the G8, Tony referred to, uh, organizations that represent researchers like Codata, about the importance of, of data sharing. I'm intrigued. Does it help you in a national context to have these international uh, statements about the value of this, or do you find that you have to appeal primarily to national concerns when you're making decisions about where to to put funding into infrastructural research? Um, I think it's helpful. I think I think the fact that uh, over the the tipping point year that that Tony referred to, um, there was a clear emerging international consensus um, about the need for open data. Um, and, and to move on from open publications um, helps set the political context quite usefully. Um, if this is what proper grown-up countries do, uh, we should be one, <laughs> that kind of argument. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I think that, uh, that our research councils um, were both largely driven by their own international context. Um, the NHMRC, for example, our equivalent of the MRC, uh, is a party to a series of international research collaborations in the health field um, where there are requirements for open data. You're not, you're not in them if you're not you know, doing that. And so I think they, they moved earlier um, because of those uh, emerging norms um, in the disciplines in which they worked. Um, and so it, it is helpful, but at the end of the day, it's going to come down to some pretty pragmatic decisions uh, about the context that those, those funders uh, and their funded researchers are working in. Thank you. I, think that's, uh, I fully agree with Claire. And I think international uh, statements and agreements are very helpful for national discussion because it highlights 
uh, the, the discussions and the themes. And also, uh, since the researchers are part of the international community, it also puts pressures for them. It hopefully one day also shows how merits are achieved via this one, with the open data, open publication. And, and so it gives an incentive for a national discussion, but it doesn't pay. And, and that's a difficulty sometimes. Uh, so we have to discuss how far we can go in funding system. We discuss now our funding, basic funding models, for instance, now. And uh, also there, uh, I think one issue which is important in EU is the EU infrastructures, which are supporting open data, for instance. So uh, for those, when, when international discussions highlight issues, uh, we have to go back to national level and see if this is important and relevant for our country to keep the scientific society competitive. And in many cases, it is like that. And, and then it's, it's for national decisions to support those who are already ahead, who actually do it, and then bring the other ones along. Mark? I would say this. They do help. I, mean, I have to <coughs> declare an interest. I was one of the people behind the OECD principles and guidelines and access to publicly funded research data. Um, and they've, I think they have proved useful for funders to say, look, Here's an international body, well-respected well body, says this is important. We have to take that on board. It tends to be fairly sort of, to some extent, self-referential in that the people who know about it are the people on the international bodies doing the work to get these international statements in place. But I think from a, a research council perspective, we found things like the OECD guidance uh, are very useful because it helps put what we do at a national level into a, a more international context. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I'd like now for the last five minutes or so to, to, to shift just slightly into this domain of education and training. Um, I mean, if one looks back at the spectrum of scientific modes of operation, from the way in which individual disciplines make their observations, the way in which theory is uh, counterpointed to those observations, the way in which we've, uh, over the last two or three decades, uh, absorbed uh, the black arts of simulation into a whole variety of, of, of disciplines. The question that arises in relation to the data deluge, then is, is the training and support for undergraduates, early, early career researchers and established researchers, is it appropriate? It seems to me there are two parts of that. One is a support, and we talked about the library and the potential the library might have in a new incarnation in giving support, so that if you're a clever young biologist, you don't necessarily have to be an informatician in order to be able to deal with your data. You get support from others who are more expert than you are. But the question is, what about the, the, the proactive education and training of young scientists and young yeah, and indeed across the whole range, really, of, of, of disciplines uh, and, support, uh, and training early career researchers. Do we, is action important? Do we need to focus on it more? Are we doing enough? Yes. Shall I go? OK, yes. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Um, Wendy White, University of Southampton. I'll try and tie in three strands together as, as the conversation's been evolving. Um, I think you're right, Geoffrey, libraries do have a part to play here in terms of the education and training. Uh, and at Southampton, the library's involved, along with lots of other people, including close dialogue with researchers as to what they want in terms of their community support uh, with a variety of disciplines where you know, we're away, you need to take a very layered, nuanced approach to this. And, and that's the key, I think. We were talking about what are the roles, roles of libraries. And it is about having that active dialogue with the research community. The question for libraries has always been, how can we add value to the scholarly communication process? Um, uh, and the answer is by continuing that dialogue with those people who are producing the scholarly communication. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the other areas is potentially the dialogue with funders. We've just been having a very interesting debate about the funder angle. Um, libraries can add there too in terms of interpreting and working with the funders uh, to maximise the interaction between their policies and the engagement with the research community. And we're all working together on that. Thanks. Yes. Okay. I'm Jeremy Frey, from, also from Southampton, so I'll follow Wendy with a comment. You don't have to agree, by the way. Uh, absolutely, I do, well, and I want to extend it. Uh, so I'm a chemist, but I also look after the RCUK, one of the RCUK digital economy networks of IT and so utility, and we have a libraries for the future theme. And one of the things I would like to say there is that in discussion, and Wendy's been part of those, um, libraries are perhaps returning to what they historically were. 
uh, not just to aid the dissemination and the, uh, and the finding of knowledge, but the creation of that knowledge. They are research spaces. They always were. People came, brought stuff to them, copied stuff, thought about stuff, and left stuff there. So I think that's a really important role. So they're not just educators about how to do the research. They are parties to it. And I think that's really important in the lesson that we have a, looked at a little bit here in this talk. But there's a, it's perhaps not surprising when talking about curation. There's a tenor of the discussion that you do your work, and then you worry about what you're going to do about disseminating it. This is a disaster. Um, I was very impressed last week. I saw my six, six, nearly seven-year-old son's work in his primary school about doing some science with circuits. They are being given lessons there, whether they remember them, that many of our undergraduates have forgotten if they never learnt it, about what you should be doing. This is nothing new about digital. This is about doing your observations, recording them yeah. completely to the best of your ability and making sure somebody else can understand it. In his case, at least read it. Um, but uh, the, this is a lesson we have forgotten. We, yeah, yeah, we appear yeah. to have assumed that somebody, by the time we've got to PhD students, that they understand why they're doing the work yeah. and what their responsibilities <laughs> are. And I think our professional bodies have something to deal with here about what are the ethical and moral responsibilities yeah. about conducting research. And if we forget that, all this other stuff is a waste of time. And indeed, a huge waste of time when you have to do something about your data record to get it published, yeah. which should not have been the case. Yeah. And we were discussing in the thing that Tony put up about the Whitehurst statement, lab notebooks were explicitly uh, not included in what was currently thought to be yeah. necessary to yeah. produce as your record of research. That clearly is crazy for transparency yeah, going forward. So there's a lot to be done, but a lot of it would have been the same had we had this discussion 30 years ago. Um, uh, but maybe because we're putting so many more people through the system, we have a difficulty. But we've got to get these fundamental lessons in place before we can worry about anything else. Uh, as an aging person, anyone who, who, who mentions that the past was really better is something that appeals to me greatly. When I remember when I was a little lad compiling my physics notebooks, um, and handed in for marking, um, object the experiment, uh, equipment, method, results. If any of those were left out, then I'd be for the high jump. Uh, now, we, on a standard basis, we do it. We, the, the, the basic lessons that were drummed into us when we were kids have been forgotten to some degree. So, great. Peter. Very briefly, to continue this um, almost the loving that we're now doing, which is really good. <laughs> um, it seems to me, so, um, uh, so it, in case I'm mistaken for being a librarian, um, I'm actually a lab statistician um, who, who has, has become a geographer uh, recently. Um, and it seems to me there's a little tripod on which we build things now, because digital is different. There is something about the malleability of it that is not there in a pre-digital way. There's, there's lots and lots of excitement and opportunity. So the tripod goes back to, um, uh, uh, so I, I came across something I called Michael Buckland wrote about two traditions, the document tradition and the computational tradition. And these were very different traditions in the sense the document tradition is very interested in provenance and where the, how data comes about and, uh, uh, and, and the like, as well as what it's about, it's how it came about. And obviously the computational tradition is to do with how we can make something computational with use of algorithms and the rest. And the tripod is actually the ology. That is to say, we have a huge variety of ologies. You know, that we know there are wars between different disciplines, and within any discipline, there's another war going on, etc. So, that there is this other perspective onto what we understand as knowledge, and indeed, what we understand as data being evidential for something. And and that seems to me where the tripod is: is that the the combination in a modern research library or a whatever digital curation unit or whatever we're going to be calling these organisational gangs is this blend between a respect for provenance and understanding of how things come about, this notion that we are in a computational age, and that gives us huge ideas about how we recombine things and curate things in the sense that we are able to do things other than just preserve the fixity of stuff. And then this ology, which is, you know, the the variety of ology, <laughs> uh, and, and which we've no control and is about new understandings that come through. So how we fix and combine our 
professional backgrounds, you know, whether we're records managers or whether we're archivists or whether we're librarians or statisticians or whatever, you know, those are going to be important, but it's to do with this collision zone that we're creating. Thank you very much. Well, I suggest now we're... Um, <laughs> Kevin is gesticulate, or has been gesticulating fiercely in my direction, so we better draw a line under things. But first of all, I'd, what I'd like to do is to ask the panel members, if there's one important thing that's come from this discussion, what's it been? Where, what's your top item? Uh, come on, Mark. Can I go last? Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll there we are. Okay. Off you go. Um, I guess the, the thing that struck me and that really resonated with our experience in Australia, there, there were two things. One of them is um, the point that was made towards the end of the discussion about what, what actually are the requirements of, of conducting research and recording that research. One of the things that, that we've found useful and that ANS has used as a bit of a stick uh, in our context is, is a thing called the Code of Conduct for the Responsible... Co uh, responsible conduct of research, so I don't use the word conduct twice, I can't remember the, no, the name, but basically to, to push home to institutions and researchers what they're doing and why uh, and what their obligations are in, in terms of, of keeping their records, keeping their data, making it reproducible and so on. And I, think, I think that that um, part of the discussion has been really useful and important. Um, the other aspect that I wanted to spend a, a second on is about whether it's the library, whether it's the IT department, whether it's whoever happens to run your digital depository, repository, um, doesn't so much matter. There is a set of services and the more joined up that they are inside of a university and the more they are related to the research office uh, and those other policy areas in a university, the more organised, efficient, effective the university looks to everybody from outside. Um, so it doesn't, doesn't matter to funders, I don't think, how you cut it, uh, as, as long as those things are working together um, and are in some way working. Thanks. Rita. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's pretty much about the discussion about culture change and what affects on that one. And I, I believe that uh, people and organisations change culture only by experience, and, and, and experience you gain when you have something to work with. So I think that actually education part, which we didn't have time to discuss so much, is, is joined with, the, with experience and possibilities experiencing open data, open, open research, open access, is that you need to support the same time building up those tools. And then you can train people to use those tools, and then they ask more support, and then you have to fund more. And then it's like uh, interlinking with, with education and support and experience in both. And that is something I think we had to develop internationally and national level, that we provide these situations and experiences which then push institutions and researchers and countries to, to support this on a very holistic way. And I very much pick up many things to bring that message back home too. Thank you. Thank you. Mark? I think there's a couple of points come out for me. One I think is a potential really exciting role of the library function in the future and how we build that into, into the research process. And I think the other one is, is something we picked up on about the importance of these international statements. And maybe there's something we as funders should do together to almost develop, I guess it's what I would tend to call the, the agenda for data. So at least if all the funders can ensure they're all singing from the same hymn sheet to the same set of basic principles, it will help maybe provide a clearer environment within which the research institutions and the researchers can then get on and do it. Okay. Can I just add one then valedictory note? It's interesting that uh, all the members, the people in this hall, I think we're all of us, well pretty much all of us, from countries where the research base is well healed, well funded, uh, mature and developing rapidly and coming to terms <coughs> with the issues we've been discussing. But we must also remember that there are research bases that are, that are building in many parts of the world which are much less able to cope with these rapidly emerging issues than those represented here. And I think the large question in my mind, or a large, possibly the largest question in my mind, is to what responsibility do we have given science and research to be international enterprises and crucially important, many of us would suppose, for the development of the human species in a healthy and sustainable fashion. What responsibility do we have for supporting our colleagues in other less well endowed systems? Now we have some, there are, the, there's been mentioned this morning of a series of body, international bodies which attempt to sustain, develop and promote these, these areas. How, how important do you think, as an audience, 
um, the issue of preventing yet another knowledge divide uh, ought to be for these international bodies. Can I ask you to vote? Who thinks it's really important these international bodies really ought to take the disparity of competence in this domain as a, as a primary issue? Hands up and all. Mm. Some grudging, some enthusiastic. Interesting, yes. I guess it's about 60% 60, 60 yes, 40% no show. Um, we'll not explore it any further. Tony. Can, can I make a final comment? I now work in the University of Washington, what used to be the physics library. It's now the Data Science Institute. Good point on which to end. Kevin, over to you. Andy, thank you very much uh, to Jeffrey Trering and to our panel. <laughs> and thank you to all of you for your contributions. Clearly, there's a lot more that could have been said uh, on all those topics. So for